Hi everyone, Nick Ortner here, New York Times best-selling author of The Tapping Solution, and I am so delighted to be joined by my dear friend Dawson Church, PhD, amazing man. Written Dawson, how many books have you written? I've only written two. I have written so many, I've lost count, Nick. But uh, oh come the, on, the, give me a number. Count, Genie in Your Jeans and the EFT Manual, my my personal two favorites. Okay, but I want a number. Like, give me all the books. Well, you just sent me some other one. And... I, you know, when I when I worked, worked in New York, I edited about two hundred books, and that was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work in my old career. Books are these things behind me, by the way. We've forgotten that they exist. They they like have pages and covers and things like that. And I see you have some behind you as well. But we uh, do. We have we have matching backgrounds we here. Do. We mm -hmm. planned it that way. Well, Dawson, thank you. Uh, for those of you that don't know Dawson, besides having written Genie in, in Your Genes, the EFT manual, he is a leading researcher in the field of EFT tapping. We really owe a majority, I don't know what percentage, but it's, it's in the high 90s, a majority of the amazing research that's happening in EFT to Dawson. So, Dawson, let me start by saying thank you uh, from all of us to you on that. And I think your biggest accolade, and maybe we'll get it along the way, uh, besides being a great author and researcher, is that you have the be uh, the world's best laugh. And uh, <laughs> there we go. So well, get a little bit so of much. it. And I try so to Dawson, laugh we're not loud and laugh often. I love it. I love it. So we're not here to talk about books or laughter, though. I'm sure they'll they'll find their way to this conversation. We're here to talk about relationships. And uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, people spend a lot of time looking at say their financial situation, you know, how do I make more money and how do I find more abundance, which is an important topic. They spend a lot of time worrying about their body and weight loss and maybe the health of their body and pain relief. But relationships seem to sort of be tucked away into a little corner. And uh, why do you think that is? Well, I think that people think that the way relationships are is just a natural occurrence. They don't mm. realize they can have tremendous leverage over the way their relationships are. And so I was married before, for example. My first wife thought that a happy marriage just happened. It was just a magical thing, like in the storybooks and in the movies, that people fell in love, and if you were compatible, marriage would be plain and simple and smooth. So when I would say things like, Let's go to a therapist. Let's read this book on rekindling passion in the marriage. Let's do this personal growth class. Let's go see this, this teacher. She would say, she'd be very resistant to doing that. She'd say, you know, I, I, I think we, we need to figure it out by ourselves. So we never did much conscious work together on the relationship. Now, you can do conscious work yourself without your partner, but if you have two people both doing it, it's much more powerful. As people think that Somehow, if they have the right chemistry, and we'll talk more about chemistry later on in the call, if they have the right chemistry, if they're compatible, that things will just work out smoothly. And they don't. We have these, these, this cycle where things are really great at first, we're intensely attracted, we're bonded, and we'll, I'll go into the hormones and the neurotransmitters and the, the biochemistry, why that is. We have this intense bonding period. But after that, usually there's a big crash, and people after yeah. six months or two years find themselves not feeling in love anymore, not feeling very good about the other person anymore, not feeling good about the relationship or themselves anymore, and that's the consequence of that neglect of consciously working on your relationships. Mm, wow, wow, what a great answer. So, let me see if I, if I get this right. People sort of put it to the side because they're just going with the belief that it is just the way it is, right? That relationship is just almost set in stone where we feel like there's so much personal growth around other things we do. We always, especially if you're listening to this call, you believe in how you can change your life and this, that, and the other, but we seem to put relationships in a different category that is just, this is the way it is. Think back to the movies you've seen. When did you last see a movie where the couple finally got together, were happy, were blissful together, and then they said, you know, we should go take a nonviolent communication class <laughs> so we can preserve this. We should go learn to tap. We should learn active listening because, you know, dear, I don't really feel heard now mm. in the third or the sixth month or the twelfth month or the third year of our relationship. So you don't learn these conscious skills. And one of the, the great illustrations I use about love versus skill, oh, Nick, here's something that makes me really unpopular. Here's, here's, here's the key to, the, if, if, I, if I have enemies, um, <clears throat> Here is a thing that makes people just not like me at all, and that is that one of the songs that absolutely makes my skin crawl, that I, a song, I, I just 
Ah! Is the song by John Lennon. All, all you need is love. Da, 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 da. All you need is love. And it's not true. You need skill. You need skill as well as love. I use the illustration of, say, he were flying. You live, you probably fly out of New York mostly, and uh, I usually fly out of San Francisco. And imagine if you went to New York, you were going to fly across the country, and you walked into the terminal, hadn't booked your ticket yet, and you had a choice of planes to go on. So you went, and the, the flight crew was hanging out there, getting ready as well. So you went up and talked to the captain of plane number one going to a destination. And you talked to this captain, and he just absolutely loved flying. He says, I love flying. I've wanted to be a pilot all my life. And flying is my passion, the, the most thing I'm, I'm craziest about, it, this love of flying. So you ask him, well, how many hours do you have in the Airbus 300, the plane we're on today? And he says, well, it's actually my first flight in a large commercial jet. I'm piloting for the first time. But gosh, I love flying so much. You walk over to the next gate, and there's a really sour-looking guy there who looks miserable and paranoid and depressed. And so he's going to be your pilot in the other plane. And he just is he's counting the days toward retirement. His whole energy uh, just, just is, isn't very pleasant. And so you talk to him about flying, and you ask him, well, how many hours do you have in the Airbus A300? And he says, oh, I'm the most experienced pilot in the fleet. I have over 10,000 hours in this type of aircraft. Never had any kind of problem or incident. He has skill. So the first guy has all this love, maximum love, zero skill. The second guy has maximum skill, zero love. Who are you going to fly with? You need to have skill as well as love. And if all you need is love, all you, all you have is love, unfortunately, we have a whole track record in history, most of us behind us, showing us that if you have love but not skill, your relationships almost certainly will crash. Mm. Seems to me that there's a lot of fear around relationships, too, that maybe people listening, even the thought of Nonviolent communication, even the thought of any vulnerability, or you know, we, we've failed so many times in the past at trying to be open and vulnerable, or just having relationship after relationship that didn't work. That we have all this baggage, and you know, I think baggage is such a great word that because I, you know, we are literally carrying around baggage. And when I think about relationship baggage, I have people imagine, imagine, you know, every relationship is one bag. And now you have 20 bags. And what's it like to travel from New York to San Francisco if you have 20 bags you have to carry on? You know? But literally, that's the baggage that we're carrying around with us. So tell me a little bit about that fear and, and the things that we hold on to. Yeah. And when you come into a new potential relationship, you feel hopeful, but you're bringing all of your bags along with you. And then when you're looking for sources of how to be with a new person, you turn to your old bags, usually the ones you acquired from your parents, and you're then selecting behaviors out of those bags. And then you try them out again, and they don't work yet again. So people, after a while, become very, very cynical and bitter. I know men in my community, I know women in my community, and when they turn 40, 50, 60, they're just burned out. They, don't, they may start a new relationship, but they have very little belief that they can really do things differently in the new relationship. Or you find couples that have been together for 20, 30 years, and it's just not, not very good. It's just that they're, they're living in bitterness. I talked to one friend this last weekend, and he said that listening to his parents talk, it was like a point scoring system. They try and score points off each other, and their whole conversation is like that. Now imagine living that way in a miserable, disappointing marriage for 30, 40 years. It has a huge effect on your physical health as well. Various research studies show that people in happy marriages have longer lifespans, and for example, men have far fewer heart attacks if they're in a happy marriage. But being single, you have less of a chance, and then people in an unhappy marriage have the worst chance of all. So in terms of health and longevity, people in a happy marriage have the highest amount of health and longevity. People who are in an unhappy marriage have the lowest, and then single people are somewhere in between. So this is affecting your immune system, it's affecting inflammation in your body, it's affecting all kinds of health factors. So it really pays to have do whatever you can consciously to create, have the skills to create that great relationship. Yeah, no, that's great. And I imagine, you know, we're talking to a wide audience and we're gonna have people on a scale, right? So some people are gonna be 
really unhappy marriage, really happy marriage, really happy marriage people, fantastic. And uh, you'll still learn from our conversation. But then we have in between, and it seems to me that there's sort of this middle zone too. The, the, the deeply unhappy people know they have to do something about it, right? So hopefully with this conversation, the tips that we give today, they use it, they go deeper, they explore it further. But they know they've got to change because it brings misery. And then we also have single people who could be, you know, would like to be in a relationship but are okay, or single people who are really miserable. Then we also have people who are just okay with their relationships or are just getting by. And they wouldn't say they're miserable. They wouldn't say that it's a great source of pain, but maybe it's sort of, you know, sort of like leading lives of quiet desperation, that it's just, it's not what they want it to be. Tell me about that place. I mean, is that a place that you can fix, you know, when you're in not in so much pain that you take action, but not so great that you're really happy? Yeah. And that's a great spectrum to think of. And many things in our lives are across some kind of spectrum. And so people who are just getting by, people are having an okay relationship, but not a fantastic one. There is so much you can do. You have, you have a lot to start with. People who are really entrenched in bitterness and disappointment and sadness, uh, you're right. That's, that, that's a hard place to escape from. And you may realize yeah, you need radical change in your life. But if your relationship's just okay, you can make it way better. When we're in love during that initial honeymoon phase and uh, we're just we're, we're, we're crazy about the other person we're having sex all the time we just can't wait to see our beloved we're just really turned on by being with them all kinds of biochemical changes are happening in our body and research shows that the hormone oxytocin your main bonding hormone actually doubles in that period you have this huge flow of oxytocin and oxytocin makes you bond but what happens after about a year is your levels of oxytocin drop a lot and the beloved no longer produces this intense flood of neurochemicals in your body. And the reason Mother Nature designed us that way is because Mother Nature had a big investment in us getting together as human beings and mating. So we mate and you perpetuate the species. That's a great thing in terms of evolutionary biology. But once you produced a child or two, Mother Nature wants you to go on and mate with somebody else and produce more genetic diversity and more genetic diversity and maybe throw up a useful innovation. Like, you know, uh, monkeys don't have this opposable thumb over here. I can turn my thumb around like that. Monkeys can only grasp like that. So that was an evolutionary innovation. There was a genetic mutation in a lot, maybe 400,000 years ago that allowed that thumb to do that. That allowed us to grasp tools and have enormously greater leverage over our lives than being able to move your fingers only in this dimension. So Mother Nature loves these genetic innovations, and so she'll push us to being with a new person or being bored with the old person after a year or two. So there are ways, there are I skills. Thought, I thought we loved Mother Nature. Well, oh, yeah, man. right. <laughs> she wants us to be together for a while and then not so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what you can do is, if you're in that space of your relationship being okay, you can use these tools to make your relationship fantastic again and actually change your oxytocin levels and trick mother nature, trick your brain, check, trick that way of thinking into believing you're with an exciting new person again. So if you're in a blah relationship, if you're in an okay, you know, maybe there's not a lot of conflict, there's not a lot of passion either. There are things you can do consciously, just little behaviors you can adopt that will drive those oxytocin levels sky high again. And you'll find people who were just kind of bumping along and having okay relationships who can, if they do the, do the work, can have fantastic, blissful, in love relationships, even after 10 years or 20 years. I was with John and Bonnie Gray earlier this year and just had a lot of uh, in-depth time with John. John is the author of, we, we both know him, he's the author of the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And we just, just comparing notes. He was sitting there with his wife, Bonnie. I was sitting there with my wife, Christine. And they were just, you know, you know what women are. Women just sit down. They just talk up a storm. Yeah. They just you know, basically keep on going. But John and I were just ex so excited about this whole idea that you can shift your hormones over time to have fantastic relationships. They've been married for 30 years. And they, he listens to her. He tunes into her. He's attentive to her. She's respectful of him. It's a beautiful thing to watch a couple who's been together decades still having that kind of relationship. 
but it takes work. It takes them having done certain things really consciously to create the love, the laughter, the humor, the connection that you can have after decades. Mm. You know, I love that you bring in the biology because I think it's so important in whatever aspect of our life we're exploring to really acknowledge the biology. And because when we do, I feel like it takes a little bit of the burden off of totally. us. It's so yeah. easy, especially when we're doing this work. You know, for example, you know well about the negativity bias in the brain, that yes. our brain is designed to look for the negative. Again, an evolutionary perspective that totally. says, you know, our ancestors were likely, I like to joke that our ancestors were likely very negative, pessimistic people uh, right. who were looking for danger at all times. Right. Why? Because they survived. And the, the happy-go-lucky, you know, the ones who were doing affirmations didn't make it, you know. Exactly. Now, we're in a point in our evolution where we can say affirmations to be positive and have it be a positive evolutionary trait, but we're fighting against, you know, eons of negative evolutionary traits. So it seems like the same is the case here, that Mother Nature set something up. We're now making a conscious choice to change that perspective because we want to, you know, have this happiness and stability and, and keep experiencing these great emotions, but we have to sort of hack our biology in order to do that. In fact, it's even worse than you think. That, that, that sounds pretty really <laughs> depressing, that our biology is pushing us to negativity. We have the negativity bias in our brain where we look for the bad thing. Carl Rogers, yeah. the great family therapist of the 20th century, called it finding the blemish. And Swami Satchidananda used to hold, get a big white sheet, hold it up to his students, take a red magic marker, make a little dot in the middle of the sheet, and hold it up and say, now what do you, say, what do you see here? And they would say, we see a red dot. And he would say, no, this is a huge white sheet with a tiny red dot, and you're fixated on the red dot. Carl mm. Rogers called that finding the blemish. Our brains are honed. Our brains have, have been trained for centuries to find the bad thing in our partner, in our world, in our finances, in ourselves, in our, our bodies. And so what happens is that not only did your ancient ancestors survive by being paranoid, scanning the environment for threats all the time to react to, they passed those genes on to their children. And the most paranoid survived and passed their paranoid genes on to their children, of which only the most paranoid survived, who passed their genes on to their children. So you and I are the product now of <laughs> thousands of generations with brains that are so good at finding the bad stuff and, you know, the good stuff. If our ancestors missed the beautiful sunset, missed the sound of laughing children, didn't stop to smell the roses, nothing bad happened. They survived. Sure. So our brains evolved absolutely no capacity to notice the good things in our lives or stick with them. Now, there's a wonderful little way you can trick your brain to shifting that negativity bias. And that is that the uh, neurons grow really quickly and new synaptic connections form between neurons really quickly. And one way you can hack your brain to start to counteract the negativity bias is to pay attention to positive experiences for 20 seconds or more. That's mm. the time it takes for those new neural synaptic connections to start to form. So, if for example, you have a wonderful experience with your partner, like uh, Christine and I have this phrase we use called love bathing. And last night we got home and I said, darling, let's just love bathe for a while. So we got a glass of wine, we went outside, we have a koi pond, we have like a little fire pit, it's, it's beautiful there. We have a gorgeous view of the, of the valley below. We just sat there and just talked about nothing, and I, I looked at, she bought some new, new shoes, which I was looking at, and we, we just ha had fun just hanging out. And so 20 seconds, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, for a long time, you're reinforcing those positive experiences. Do it often enough, and you're literally rewiring your neural network. Not only are you wiring it in every 20 seconds for those positive experiences, but this is, this is research done by a Nobel Prize winning doctor called Eric Kandel. He won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2000. And he showed that if you quit using a neural network, so now, for example, I'm not using the network of anger and resentment and misery and all the other relationship qualities I used to have, that within three weeks, your body starts to disassemble those neural networks. So I'm no longer 
practicing being angry, practicing being resentful, practicing blaming and shaming and all the other bad behaviors, after a while, your body is really smart. It says, gee, Dawson's not using those circuits of misery in his brain anymore. Let's disassemble those molecules and use them for something else. So that's how you counteract the negativity bias. You, when you have a positive experience, savor the sunset for 20 seconds or more. Two minutes is even better, but it takes 20 seconds of attention to start to build the new connections, and then after a while, if you don't use the old connections, your brain realizes, oh, not using them, starts to take them apart. And over time, if you do this for years and years and years, you're literally rewiring your brain till the whole way you do relationships totally changes. You can, cha you can change mm -hmm. from being a curmudgeon who just drives people away and is nothing but a living, you know, Virginia Satir pretty much founded the field of family therapy in the 1950s and 60s. And she had a very bleak view of marriage. She said, she was a wonderful person. I met her a couple of times, but man, she, she said, she, she, her definition of marriage, she said marriage, is two sets of family dysfunctional patterns seeking to come together and perpetuate themselves to the next generation. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. <laughs> How's that for a bleak picture, you know? So, again, she didn't know about EFT or any of the advanced tools we have now. She thought we were pretty much locked into this and was really, really, really hard to change. But it's possible mm. to change, and after you start to do these practices and deliberately shift yourself over and over and over again, after a while, you have a whole neural network, a whole new way of processing information that predisposes you to happiness. Like, for example, if, you know, if I feel bad or down, it feels really unnatural. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't, sure. doesn't feel sure. good. So I'm highly motivated to go meditate, to go tap, take mm -hmm. a walk in nature, do something to break that cycle. But if you're used to that misery, we have set points for hormones yeah. like cortisol and adrenaline in our bodies, and those are our comfort levels. And if your, if your cortisol set point is way up here, maybe that was really adaptive for you when you were in your crazy family at the age of two or three or four. You, know, you needed to be on high alert because mom's an yep. alcoholic and dad's a rageaholic and you have all this craziness and sister and brother. So you got your cortisol stuck on this high set point that was useful to you to react quickly to all the nuttiness in your family. But now you're 30, you're 40, you're 50, and you've still got your cortisol stuck way high on this high set point. Mm -hmm. But if you do these, these kinds of skills, practices, you can then lower your set point. And then if you have a stressful experience, and it elevates your cortisol and adrenaline, you're then very motivated to go do something to shift that because it feels bad in your body. So you yeah. lower your set point. Like, like Christine and I joke sometimes, we have an allergy to drama. We just, you know, just don't yeah. like drama. It just yeah. makes us feel not good. Yeah. So we don't yeah. do it. And if we have people who are full of drama, we just, you know, basically smile and walk away and do something else. So you, you lower and your yet, set and, point. And yet some people are addicted to drama. They are. And they, not even consciously, feel like they need it in their life. I love, I love that set point concept. It's huge. They're addicted to high cortisol. And so, for example, yeah. the woman who seeks out men who uh, cheat, cheat on her, betray her, uh, lie to her, and so on, and then she keeps on finding more and more relationships like that. She, she, she ditches one guy, finds another guy who does the same thing. She's really addicted to that high level of cortisol. If she's with a nice, clean, sober, kind, sweet man, she'll say, there's no chemistry. And there isn't, there's no high cortisol there. She's looking for, a, essentially a drug addict, a, she's a drug addict looking for a pusher to give her a fix of cortisol. So we get our cortisol stuck on high like this, way, 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 way too high. And then we seek out experiences, people, and lifestyles that that match that high cortisol that we're used to. So it's really important to start to lower your cortisol set point because over time, studies show that high cortisol is linked to osteoporosis, loss of bone density, loss of muscle mass. High cortisol is linked to heart disease, to cancer, to diabetes, to holding belly fat. There are skin wrinkling. High cortisol leads to skin wrinkling, all kinds of bad effects long term from high cortisol. So you really, you can't afford to have this high set point over time. It corrodes your body. Mm, amazing. So that's, so that's the bad news or the reality <laughs> of, of where we are. 
um, which, you know, that's where we have to start. This is the truth of where we are. Yeah. That's what we start with tapping. This is how I feel. This is what my biology is doing to me. These are the patterns that I'm running. The question now is, what do we do about it? How does, how does tapping come in to rewire this brain and to change these old patterns? Tapping is the most efficient technique I've found to break that cycle and lower the stress response. And believe me, I have looked all over the place for techniques. And I use a lot of other techniques too. I meditate every yeah. morning, like I meditated today for about an hour this morning. I tune into myself, I read inspirational books, I spend time in nature. Uh, I love Gestalt therapy. I took many Gestalt therapy classes along the road. And so there, there are tons of tools we can use to, to help us. But tapping, I found, is simply the most efficient. It just works super, super, super quickly. And you can use tapping both to release the stress of negative experiences and to reinforce that 20 seconds. So if you hold that thought for 20 seconds, hold that positive experience while you're growing those synapses for 20 seconds, and you tap, I believe you reinforce the process. If you're releasing negative stuff from your life, you feel annoyed, irritated with your partner or with yourself, do some tapping and you can release that. So EFT is one of many tools and you need things besides EFT, like you need to be able to listen to your partner. That is a non-negotiable skill. And what happens... You can't, just, you can't just tap on them when they're trying to talk <laughs> and just... You know. Unfortunately not, because you have to sit there and you may feel, hey, that's not true. I need to defend myself. That didn't really happen that way. I need to set you straight. I need to set the record straight. So oh. you have now what that feeling of urgency is is your cortisol rising, and you need to not talk when you feel the biggest impulse to say, oh, "Hold, just stop. Don't talk. Mm -hmm. Tap instead. Wait till your cortisol drops. It only takes about five minutes for your body to begin to dissolve those cortisol molecules. Wait till your cortisol drops." then you start talking. So yeah, tapping is super efficient, both for reinforcing good experiences and taking the stress out of bad experiences. Yeah. And you've actually done research on tapping and cortisol levels, measure them specifically, correct? We did a big study, 83 people. It was published in the oldest peer-reviewed psychiatry journal in North America. 83 people who got either an hour of tapping or an hour of talk therapy or an hour of simply resting, taking it easy. And we found that in the group that got talk therapy and that got rest, their cortisol levels dropped a fair amount. And their levels of anxiety and depression dropped as well. But in the EFT group, their levels of anxiety and depression dropped twice as much, more than twice as much as either of the other two groups. And the levels of cortisol declined significantly. And there was a, a link between the drop in mental health problems like anxiety and depression and the drop in cortisol. So we call it mental health. It's really a physiological phenomenon as well. It's a balance in our bodies between cortisol, DHEA, serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, all these neurotransmitters and hormones are changing as we use EFT. So you'll see a person, for example, relax, their shoulders drop, they're not as tense anymore, their breathing regularizes. What's happening when you see that is they're feeling better, literally the feeling better in their bodies, and you can't see this, but their levels of serotonin and dopamine are coming into balance, their levels of cortisol and DHEA are coming into balance, and that feel-good physical feeling actually means that there's a biological event happening in their bodies. It's triggering the expression of genes, and those genes mm. are then building these hormones like cortisol and DHEA. So we call it psychology, we think of it as a psychology, it's physiology as well, it's literally affecting your body. And then think about all those health consequences of cortisol. We're reversing that osteoporosis, we're reversing that loss of muscle mass, we're reversing that loss of bone density. All of these positive medical sequels of taking care of our mental and spiritual health. Oh, amazing, amazing. So um, we know the problem. We know that we're not as happy as we want to be in relationships. We know that there's a biological component. We know that there's things that we're probably holding on to from our past that are affecting that daily biology and running these same patterns over and over again. We know that tapping might be a tool to help that, but it seems like a wide landscape. Like, how do we attack this first? Or, you know, how. Where do we start with this big challenge of relationships? Start at the point of maximum stress. 
And what we what I teach people when I'm talking to them about EFT and relationships is that you know you're triggered. Most people know that there are certain things that trigger them. Uh, my mother-in-law is a lifetime Democrat. My father-in-law is lifetime Republican. <sighs> And it's, it's so funny, you know, to my father, I said, yeah. Democrat, he has a big reaction to my, my mother-in-law, said the word Republican, she has a big reaction. You know, so uh, maybe you have a big reaction to something. There was one. So, so even my, though my husband's a Republican, is that, a Republican, even though my wife's a Democrat, you know, <laughs> is that what, you, what your mom's tapping on? <laughs> whatever, whatever it might be, like this one woman in one of our live workshops and um, she came up to the front to work with me. And she was so angry at her husband, who wasn't at the workshop. And she said, I'm, I'm so mad at my husband. He does not help out around the house. And she had this intense anger, and it was really affecting her whole marriage. And mm. so I asked her to tune into her body, figure out where she felt it in her body. We then found early events that had triggered that same physiological feeling in her body. It turned out that she was raised in Eastern Europe, and... Her mom did all the housework, did all the work. Her dad sat around, smoked cigarettes, drank beer, and shot the breeze with her, with, her, with her uncles. And so she had all this intense resentment of her father from an early age. We tapped on that. And once that had all been tapped down to a low number, a zero, I said, well, now tell me again about your husband and him not helping with the chores around the house. And she burst into tears. and She said... He tries so hard, and mm. however much he does, it's never good enough for me. I, I'm writing him all the time, and no amount of effort on his part is, ever satisfies me, and I realize I'm really hurting our marriage by what I'm doing. So again, same events, whole different yeah. frame. Once she yeah. worked on the childhood stuff, that was holding her back. So that's just one example of many. I, mean, I can tell you literally hundreds of stories about how EFT has dramatically affected marriages and relationships for single people as well. There was one, there's a fun story from Pat Carrington and uh, talk about our neural network and shaping our neural network. Pat was working with one lady who came to her for relationship issues, single woman, and her core belief was, many single women have this core belief, all the good men are taken. All the good men are taken. So Pat worked on her on childhood stuff and adult stuff. And over the course of their therapy sessions, she, she cleared tons of these dysfunctional experiences and core beliefs. Then she bounced into Pat's office one day and she said, I met somebody. He's fabulous. He's wonderful. I have started going out with him. And it seems like a really good thing. And Pat had had her make lists of what she was looking for, looking for in a man. And she said, you know, of the 28 things on my list, I realize he has like 21 of them. And so they eventually got married. And after a while, Pat did some follow-up sessions with them. And they were doing fantastically well several years later. Now, here's the kicker. When she came in bouncing in that day after having met this guy, Pat said, that's wonderful. Where did you meet him? And she said, oh, he works three cubicles down from me at my office. Mm. And Pat said, and how long has he worked there? And the woman said, oh, maybe two or three years. Okay, so here she's had this belief, all the men are taken, yeah. and her future husband's been working for years, three cubicles away, and she hadn't seen him because when you have these beliefs in your mind, in yeah. your neural network, you're creating a neural frame. You're seeing everything through that lens. So there's reality there. There's stuff that's in front of you. It's available to you. Blessings, money, people, resources, love. And you won't mm. see it because you have these stories in your mind about how all the good men are taken. It's not enough. I'm not good enough. The world is this way. And it's so important to start tapping on those because when you reshift your neural network to see the world as it is, not as a projection of yourself, but the way it really is, you see the love of your life is three cubicles away. And your story that all the men have taken was a lie. It was, you know, I, I say this in my live workshops. I say most of the stories you've got in your head about the way the world is, the limiting beliefs, <clears throat> they're lies. They're installed in your head early in life, and they are complete lies. And our job with EFT is to stomp all over them and get rid of them. I love it. I love it. I know a lot of people listening are, are nodding their heads. Uh, a lot of people watching are saying, yep, those are the lives that I've been telling. And our 
desiring that magic, desiring those miracles, desiring to bring more love and passion and romance back into the relationship or to find a new relationship. So how do they go deeper? Tell me about uh, the Tapping Deep Intimacy program. Well, I looked at how to apply tapping to relationships because I saw so many people that were doing well in relationships. In fact, when I was a little baby, I remember realizing that, gee, some of these relationships around me are pretty pretty bad. I was five years mm-hmm. old, Nick, and my father is a minister, is an Episcopal priest, and he, uh, we'd have people going through our home, other priests very often, ministers, priests, and I'd see their family relationships, I'd see their, the way they would act with their spouses and with their, their children, and it wasn't good. And at five years old, I was looking at these big people who are these big adults, and they're supposed to know how the world works, aren't they? And thinking... You, you weren't six, seven when you were five, is that what you're saying? I was, I was what? You weren't six, six when you were five, or however tall <laughs> I was a little guy that looked to me as though the, the, all these big people knew how the world was supposed to work, and I sure didn't mm-hmm. know back then. Yeah. And I was just scratching my head thinking... And uh, now, uh, Father Jimmy says that he loves his wife more than anyone in the world, but he treats her worse than anyone in the world. What's that all about? Mm-hmm. I mean, I was just a little, mm-hmm. little, little, little kid trying to figure all this out. And uh, so early on, I, I realized a relationship was dysfunctional. And then I also, I got divorced when I was 40. I watched some of my friends get divorced, and I watched their children get terribly hurt. Divorce, even a good divorce, and there are very few of them, hurts mm-hmm. kids badly very often and um those experiences are are dreadful and they often, they often scar people for life people get ptsd as a result of divorce and i said to myself i watched one of my good friends also go through a terrible divorce and um i said what can i do to help if, if that couple had known a few simple skills like tapping like active listening they could have averted that disaster and there's a wonderful uh, little poem in England, which I don't think is very common in the U.S., but but it's called The Horseshoe Nail, and it simply says that for the lack of a nail, the horseshoe was lost. For mm. the lack of a horseshoe, the horse was lost. For the lack of uh, the horse, the rider was lost. For the lack of the rider, the knight was lost. For the lack of the knight, the skirmish was lost. For the lack of the skirmish, the battle was lost. For the lack of the battle, the kingdom was lost, and all for the lack of a horseshoe nail. And tapping is our horseshoe nail. Tapping is the little thing we can do that winds up having a massive effect in our relationship. So what I did was I began to gather material for a course, a systematic course, to teach people how to apply tapping to their relationship lives and systematically work through all the things that hold them back. I call this Tapping Deep Intimacy, and I was amazed. I was looking at this online, this 12-week online course. I was looking at the material recently, Nick, and I realized the earliest part of that course is 30 years old, comes from Gestalt Therapy. Mm -hmm. I've been collecting this stuff, like all these best practices for relationships, for 30 years because I have such a passion of helping people not lose the whole kingdom of their marriage or a good relationship for want of a horseshoe nail, a tiny skill that if they do that skill, they will have wonderful results and a whole different neural network. So I gathered all of these skills. There are 12 essential skills like EFT, like active listening, gathered them together in a 12-week online course, a self-paced course, audio, video, and written material. The foundation of it is my book, EFT for Love Relationships, but there are video sessions of me working with people, and i got to tell you, these video sessions are mm. real and raw. Uh, these people allowed me to film them, gave us permission to share them, but like, you know, the one session, it's a couple, and they've been married 30 or 40 years, and they're totally burned out, and they're bitter, and they start that way. And the session doesn't go well at first. I mean, they're getting more and more angry and more into their patterns. And eventually the guy says he wants to strangle me. He's so angry, you know. Uh, so actually, he told, he told me that afterwards. He said I was triggering him so bad. He wanted to strangle yeah. me during the session. But I knew that if he got access to all that buried, hidden anger, we could tap on it and release it. One other guy I worked with in one of the videos, you can't tell us from a video, 
but th this uh, we were doing this in a huge room with about 40 people and he he had so much buried emotion in him he got really hot his face got, got got flushed he was throwing up so much heat the whole room got hot his partner she had what she called her alien her pink alien which would go out and just zap him just just and so the, you know the guys huddled over here he's trying to he's very defensive trying to protect himself from her pink alien which jumps out and and swallows him so people have these these patterns and we teach them to break those patterns another couple uh, again long-term relationship oh this other this couple they told us that they so that we had this wonderful session where he, he had he had a porn addiction he had he had impotence uh she had so much anger she was like a volcano of angry energy and they told us, they told Christine and I after the course, they said, we did this, this, this particular filming live in Hawaii, and they told us that they made their booking to do the course, and so they booked the hotel, booked their airfare, paid for the course, and then after a few weeks said, you know, nothing's going to work for us, we're getting a divorce. But we've already paid for this airline ticket, and we can't get out of it, and we've already made this hotel reservation, it's non-refundable. So, you know, maybe we'll just go there and have one last vacation. And, uh, you know, it'll just be a vacation. Then we'll get divorced after that. Well, that couple in that session had a major breakthrough. And mm. when we saw them later on, they were kissing, cuddling. They were I I intimate. And, again, they had a couple of little flare-ups over the course of the next week. But they navigated them because they had these 12 essential tools that you need, the skills you need to be able to fly that plane and fly your relationship to new heights. So these are the 12 essential skills I found. And it's a 12-week course because you need time. You need to repattern your brain and practice those skills over and over and over again. That 20 seconds when you make that different choice and rewrite your life script and rewrite your neurological script. So these are all packaged together in this course called Tapping Deep Intimacy. 12 weeks, written material, audio sessions and these videos that you tap along with and you just yeah. feel all of the stuff just falling away. It's great. Amazing. Amazing. So we talked about the spectrum before. The people listening right now who are on the brink of divorce, in the middle of a divorce, in a terrible relationship where they're miserable, it would seem to me that doing this is a no-brainer, right? Maybe I'm wrong, but it seemed to me like there's that much pain there and there's a way in the 12 week, and it'll be less than 12 weeks, to start easing the pain. I'm sure in the first five minutes, you can start easing the pain. And even if, I would think that even if people are said, look, the divorce is happening, all this stuff, well, start cleaning up that old stuff now, right? Start getting rid of that baggage for that future relationship and to make that process better. So we have those people go do the course, right? Need to. And then we have that wide spectrum that we've talked about. Someone who's single, looking for the love of their life, falling again and again, seeing that that person three cubicles down doesn't seem like the right person, but they are, right? We have those blinders on. We have the single people there. We have the people in relationships that have marriages that are okay. Some people might even say they're good marriages, but they want great marriages. They want the happiest, most passionate, most fulfilling marriages. I think this is something to explore as well. So, And then we have the people in the happy, fulfilling amazing marriages and they probably took your course already and they're just listening in on this call so <laughs> they, don't, they don't need to do it again. Uh, so I think people have an opportunity here to, to go deep, to heal a lot of old wounds and I highly recommend that they do so. Take this time. I imagine you have an amazing money back guarantee on the course. We have a full, no questions asked, 14 day guarantee. So if you get into the course, it's not for you. Just send us a sign saying refund and we'll issue a prompt refund. So there's no, no risk to you. Get into the course, dive in there, try the first two weeks. And I yeah. guarantee if you aren't feeling big shifts just in the first couple of weeks, that, um, that we'll, we'll go ahead and let you out of it because you will feel so good. And we want to train you to feeling that good feeling as your default setting. We want that to be not just something you, you, you have to feel occasionally, but as your default setting. We also include with this course a year of live coaching calls with me. Every month we have a group coaching call and we give you a year of those calls after the course ends. Why? 
because we want you to totally rewire your, the way your brain does relationships. And that takes time and practice. Um, there sure. are many techniques in the course. In fact, the very first one we teach you the first week takes a few seconds to do. What it does is there's one muscle in your body, one particular muscle. If you relax that muscle, it sends a signal to your vagus nerve. And your vagus nerve travels all the way from your face down your spinal column and then out to your digestive system, your reproductive system, your circulatory system. Your vagus nerve is this long meandering nerve all over your body. It's your main relaxation nerve and there's one muscle that if you relax sends a signal to your vagus nerve to relax the whole, the whole thing. It's an amazing mm. technique and we teach that in week one because we're going to get people out of their reactivity. If you're reacting to your partner, reacting to life, reacting to people around you, you're just stuck. You're just repeating yeah. those old patterns and reinforcing that neural wiring you've got in your head already. Yeah. Got to get out of reactivity, yeah. reactivity, get out of, out of being stuck, and then you can start to learn new skills. So we teach you really intensely practical skills every week. And a lot of them are body-based. They're not mentally based because when you're, when you're having a fight with your partner, you aren't thinking. Yeah. In fact, yeah. when you're having a fight, when you're stressed, up to 70% of the blood drains from your forebrain into your peripheral muscles. So you're dumb. You know, you, 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 you've learned all this great stuff in the therapist's office or read these great books or taken a course by John Gray or Don Miguel Ruiz. But when you're stressed and the blood drains out of your forebrain, you can't remember any of it. So you mm -hmm. need things like... Be a, I'll be a caveman and I can tap. I can do this simple thing, just a physiological intervention that shifts you. So a lot of these are physical things you do. They're not mental. Now, mm -hmm. there are very important mental skills as well. But until you've got the ability to calm yourself, then the, there's not enough blood in your brain to use those wonderful mental skills. So getting calm is the first step. Then you can build on that. We also have modules mm -hmm. on things like, what do I do when I want to do this work? but my partner doesn't. Many people are stuck in marriages or relationships where they are passionately committed to personal growth and they're yep. with a partner who isn't. There's a wonderful yep. story of, 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 of people who, who did that and what they find is their partner starts to change as well. We had one woman in, in the course and she was mad at her husband of, of many, many years because she said, we have, we're retired, we have a big property and he doesn't help maintain the property. I have to do all the work as retired, he could be helping as well. And you, you know, you've got to focus on how can I change him? So I said, you can't change him, but you can reduce your own stress level, bring your own cortisol down. So I did this long session with her on one of those monthly conference calls, uh, just working on herself. She kept on saying, how do I change him? I said, change yourself. How do I change him? Change yeah. yourself. How do I yeah. change him? Quit projecting it out there onto him because when you project it out there onto somebody else, you give them your power and you render yourself powerless to change. So you bring it into yourself, tap on that. She did that and then she posted in the forum that weekend and she said, funny thing, I quit nagging my husband and like we had 32 fruit trees that needed planting and this morning without me saying anything, he got up early and went and planted all of them. And I didn't know. Like magic. Like magic. Right? <laughs> so within this program, Tapping Deep into Intimacy, you have the magic module that gets your husband or wife to do everything you want. Right? So that's great. Well, I know a lot of people listening are going to join in. I know they all want to know what that one muscle is that you have to relax. I'm going to, you know, they're all thinking, is it my bicep? Is it this? Is it? We're not going to tell you. We've given you a lot of stuff. It's in the course. It's module one. It is full, chock full of amazing information. If any part of you says, I want to experience more love, more happiness, more joy, more abundance within my relationship to heal old wounds. And, and look, Dawson, you know, relationships are our life. Everywhere we turn, they affect us. They affect our health. They affect our finances. They affect our biology. They affect how we live. So we can't just put the blinders on and ignore it and just say, well, this is just the way it is. We've got to reach higher and really look to make this change. So thank you for putting this program out in the world. And I know I can't wait to hear the stories of many people who transform their relationships and their lives with this program. 
Yeah, for those of you listening, we would love to have you on the program. You will feel the shifts right away. And whether you're single, whether you're in a long-term relationship, whether you're in a new relationship, this could make a radical difference. And I, I, I feel such love for the people who are willing to love themselves enough to do this because they change their whole future. They are no longer yeah. doing their future relationships or future relationship the way they did their past ones. They're opening up this world of pleasure, enjoyment, excitement. Just for example, oxytocin. Drive oxytocin sky high and you feel wonderful with the person you're with. So you're literally changing the levels of these pleasure and reward biochemicals in your brain and getting to feel really, really, really good. And it's just so delicious to have people have this experience for themselves in their lives long term, knowing that the Tappy Deep Intimacy course lasts 12 weeks and then there's the one year of live coaching calls, but it's something you'll take with you your entire life, shaping the whole way your brain works when it comes to relationships. So it's going to have be a high leverage point for your, your love life and also for your health because you're driving your cortisol down, you're feeling much better, and that is having positive effects on your health. So you, you will feel way better on many different levels from doing this and then have open yourself to that, that hugely beautiful, pleasurable possibility of a wonderful, loving, lifetime relationship. So Nick and I know how good those relationships can be, and we want the same thing for you. So please do go ahead, click that button there, and join me in the course. Dawson, thanks so much. Amazing, amazing information. Thanks for the great work you're doing in the world, and uh, we'll talk soon. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Take care.